Hello everyone, uh, welcome, let's make a start, it's a quick start. Great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Tim Walker, very well known to uh, everyone, I'm sure, and uh, he's going to be talking about uh, Dr. Joseph Crocombe, uh, an early doctor, and the women that shaped him. So that's intriguing. <laughs> Thanks. I'll just do a sound check first because everyone I speak to tells me to speak up even when I'm just talking in the room. Louder? Louder? Louder as well. Is this turned on? Turn the microphone up. I'll turn this up. Looks as though it's on high anyway. <laughs> I told you my mouth, the voice was soft. The cure. I cut a hull to our, cut a North Sea to Moana, uh, New Yorkshire, a howl. Co Gwen Rogers, uh, Toku Kofaya. Uh, called Trevor Walker to going uh, uh, Ki Kita Hunga uh, Mate, Kita Hunga Ora, Tanakoto, Tanakoto, Tanakoto Kato. Uh, you might not learn anything tonight except you will know why the whole accent has been voted the ugliest in Britain. When I was in school in, in Yorkshire, I dropped history as soon as I could because it was all about kings and queens and searching for power. I just couldn't relate to them, apart from the fact I couldn't remember the dates either. But, but I live in Caritani now and I, I get my firewood from the Wakawaiti Museum. And Bill who organises the wood, it's a good macrocarpa, is, was delivering the wood and he mentioned to me that they had some information on Dr. Crocom in the museum th that no one had ever seen before, so that sort of sparked my interest. Uh, and I went to the museum and they did have uh, quite a few things, uh, but not the journal that had never been seen before that I was hoping for. And uh, so I started to read about him uh, he was the first a doctor in the South Island and the second in New Zealand, but I started thinking about him as I read about him as, as the first rural doctor in the South Island because I spent 19 years in Tiano, and, uh, which was the, the best job in the world. And uh, so I was really involved in the, with the other rural doctors and uh, even now, when I've been out of Tiano for a long time, I still feel like a rural doctor, so I had this affinity, I thought, with Dr. Broken. And as, as immigrant doctors, they all have a backstory. Um, they may. Yep. I apologise for being here. There's a seat waiting for you. Uh, anyone you want. I have to leave early too, but don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so all, all immigrant doctors have got a backstory, and I was started wondering what Dr. Crocombe's backstory was, and how he came to be in New Zealand. Uh, in the days when there was just a few whaling stations jot dotted around the coast, and uh, Maori who'd been decimated by measles, flu and tuberculosis. So, Joseph Crocom was born in Bath in 1811 and to give you a feel for the times, uh, Charles Dickens was born in 1812. Uh, the, oof, I've just got to try and use this. Elizabeth Crocom is it's the same crocum as this crocum. 
Uh, just in those days, so many people were illegitimate um, that, for instance, when Elizabeth was baptised, um, she had no idea what the Reverend Vicar was writing down. Um, but Dr. Joseph Crocom was, his name was written down by his father because he was an ed educated man and he didn't know what it was, was written in the back. But it sounds sort of a bit posh, doesn't it, Crocom? So, Crocom with a K in it. So, trick this to do that. So, let's find out who, who Joseph Crocom is. Um, this is a, a part of the probate of his father's will. Um, well, I did try and send this out to people who might come uh, to give them some fun um, tran transcribing it. Uh, but it's transcribed, that little part is transcribed under there. So, unto Joseph Crocom, son of Elizabeth Crocom, who now lives with me. Well, who now lives with me is uh, Regency code for uh, my living mistress. And, but he's left him quite well set up. He's put him a hundred. He's left left him a hundred and fifty pounds per annum for his nap for the rest of his life. And. Uh, and it is my will and desire that he be brought up as a surgeon. And that's because Mr. Chopin, whose will this is, used to be a surgeon, uh, but now, or now in those times, was a plantation order in the West Indies. Plantation order in the West Indies. So he was a third generation plantation order. The first generation goes to the West Indies and, and start, starts the plantation. The second generation are sent back to England so they can get their an education and come back and run the plantation. And what, but what happens to the third generation is they go back to England, quite like it, and don't go back. And they put a manager into the plantation, which isn't very good for the slaves there because uh, slave plantations that were run by managers uh, were treated much, you know, more bad, more badly than the plantations that were uh, run by the actual owners. So, what, how did uh, Mr. Chopin um, get together with Elizabeth Crocombe? Well, it says further on in the will, <coughs> excuse me, that Elizabeth Crocombe is the a sister of his of Mr. Chopin's uh, servant William. So William has somehow introduced Elizabeth to Mr. Chopin, um, which sounds a bit sounds a bit sort of um, a bit seedy, <laughs> but it, but it actually turned out quite well for both of them. Um, what had happened is. Uh, just before they met, um, the slave trade, you know, the slave trade was abolished, and uh, it didn't mean the slavery was abolished. It means the slave trade was abolished, so you were no longer allowed to take uh, slaves from Africa and take them over to the West Indies to work. And luckily for the parliamentarians parliamentarians who um, passed this act had a, a Royal Navy which had nothing to do since the, the War of Independence in America had finished. So they actually enforced that embargo and they sailed in the middle of the ocean and picking up sl slave, slave boats or whatever you call them, slave ferries, I don't know, and um, take the slaves back to Africa and keep the boats so they had, you know, it worked quite well. Now this gave uh, gave Mr. Chopin quite a problem because the slaves were treated badly in the fields and often died. Um, so that meant they couldn't replenish their slaves. So all they could get, the only way they could get new slaves 
is by treating the women slaves well so that they could have more babies, because give them better nutrition and things like that. The trouble with that is uh, they weren't allowed to work the children in the fields until they were 10 years old. So there was quite a lag and it put quite this stress on, um, on, on the slave trainers. In addition to that, uh, Mr. Chopin's wife, uh, presumably sick of her life in Bath, had gone back to St. Vincent's in the Caribbean. Uh, she had come from a, a plantation there and that was her life that she was used to. She wasn't an English woman. And also his youngest doctor, his, sorry, not youngest doctor, young, youngest daughter, had just married, left home to get married. So he was really in sore need of, uh, of womanly comfort, uh, which he got from Elizabeth. So where did William and Elizabeth come from? The, the only Elizabeth and William Crocombe that I could find in a, in a reasonable area around Bath was Elizabeth and William Crocombe um, from Camerton. Camerton was an agricultural village about nine miles southwest of Bath. So it's quite, it's quite feasible that peop, people of the agric <coughs> agricultural class um, were moving to the big cities at those times. No. What happened a year after Elizabeth was born is that <laughs> it, was, it was a time when the government was trying to make use of waste land in the countryside. The, the parliament looked around, or the people in parliament looked around, and saw all this waste land that they wanted to be used more efficiently. And so this is, I think, when the Enclosure Act, or one of the Enclosure Acts, came in. The, um, this, this worked uh, very well for the landowners who managed to grab that land by putting it in enclosures. Um, but the, for the villagers, it was the land in which they could perhaps keep a cow or forage both winter and summer. And so... The, um, this is, so the landowner, I don't know if I said this, the landowner uh, dug a, a coal pit right in the middle of Camerton, in the middle of the village, uh, because it's part of the Somerset coal field. So the enclosures on the land prevented people from, uh, from using the, 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 what, the common land that they thought it was, but the they called it wasteland and so but everyone was promised jobs in the mines and uh, the mine managers particularly like children working down there because they could squeeze through the narrow passages and they were cheap to pay so you can see in the uh, the, the young boy and girl being lowered down into the pit and the youngest the youngest um, children were drafters. They sat next to a door, opening and closing it when coal trolleys came through. And uh, it was a really important job because the opening and the closing of the door, not the actual, not the actual opening and closing, but the position of the door, affected the airflow through the mines. So if they didn't close the door, not much air would go to the coal face. Very bad. And it also um, prevented the build-up, you know, the draft through the mine, prevented the build-up of coal damp, which of course is explosive and can be lit by the flame of the candles that they're carrying. So, you know, it was a, it was a terrible job. I'm talking about candles. The kids who sat behind the door didn't have candles. They weren't given a candle. It, they, weren't, they didn't warrant it. They didn't have any... They, it, was, it was too expensive. So they sat for 12 to 14 hours in the dark behind the door without a candle. So can you imagine any child that's been doing that can go home and, and sleep without having nightmares about monsters in the dark. 
there was a bit of light in the end at the, in the tunnel though. The uh, sorry, this uh, when they got to about <coughs> ten or twelve, they got promoted to hurriers, and these are people who move the trolleys along the twenty-inch high um, passages. So the the guy at the back there, the young boy, being about t ten or twelve, pushes with his head, and Paul pushes with his hands. Well, in this situation, Elizabeth would have been in the situation in the girl at the front, and she would have a chain attached to the trolley, which would come up between her legs and fasten to a bolt, a belt around her waist. So it's a pretty miserable existence. Um, when they grew up, this is the life they could expect. They could be colliers at the coal face. Um, still, uh, in these 20 inch passengers, passages, lying on the back and cutting the coal down for the hurriers to put in their trolleys and take it away. So it wasn't much of a, a life to live. To, to live. And there's a re Reverend Skinner of Camerton, so he was the, uh, he wasn't actually the vicar who baptised Elizabeth, but he was there at the time that she was growing up. He, he kept a journal, he was a really good journaler, and his journal's freely available. Uh, so the dangers were, according to, uh, to Reverend Skinner, falling down the pit shaft, which people did often when they were drunk, uh, rocks falling down the pit shaft and hitting people waiting below on the head, coal damp, as I mentioned, the roof collapsing, as, as killed eight-year-old William Cottrell, who was the uh, schoolmaster's son, uh, black lung, of course, pneumoconiosis, rickets, rickets because they never saw daylight. And uh, Reverend Skinner added, that, added to that depravity, because he didn't like the, uh, the nudity down the mine, um, drunkenness, because the, uh, that's how the miners relaxed, and also domestic abuse, because the miners came home drunk and beat their wife up. This, uh, this and, the and the death of um, Dr. Skinner's wife from tuberculosis um, drove him mad and he shot himself in his own orchard. So it was, it was a really severe, um, severe problem. So they, I if I can just click that. So Joseph was born in six, uh, Alfred Street, number six, Alfred Street, Bath. And uh, so, what do we know about that? This is in 1840, which is a little bit after the time that Dr. Crokin was there, or Joseph Crokin at the time. Uh, but I think the only thing that's changed in that picture would be the dresses of the women, which is more Victorian than, than Regency. Now, <coughs> Alfred Street hasn't hasn't um, changed much today. Um, so this is on the, this here, this is Lansdowne Road, the road we're looking down, and this is, this is Alfred Street coming off. When I say that uh, it hasn't changed much, this is one Alfred Street which we saw in the last engraving or whatever it was, but I see it's cloaked in scaffolding, so obviously that's changed. And the um, point of it. So, so the houses are numbered numer numerically. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's six Alpha Street Bath. Now that block of houses was um, was designed by John Wood the Elder and John Wood the Junior. And if you know anything about Bath, you'd know that this here is the circle, the Royal Circle, which um, was also designed by the Wood Duo. And this here, this rectangular building here, is the upper assembly rooms in Bath. And those are the ones that Jane Austen visited and uh, incorporated into her novels. So, so this is the door of 6 Alfred Street Bath. 
Uh, behind this door, this is where Joseph would have been conceived, um, raised and educated until he was eight. So he had a tutor at home educating him. Now, I got that picture from an Airbnb site because in, in uh, 18, not 1820, 2020, uh, Jan, my partner and I were going back to Cardiff for the 50th anniversary of my graduation. And so I was, I thought I could mix it in with finding out a bit more about Joseph Crocom and discovered this Airbnb exactly where he lived. But of course, um, Covid put <laughs> put the uh, well st stood in the way of a holiday and the uh, and the anniversary. So at the age of eight, um, he goes to boarding school, um, the boarding school of Dr. Henry Weaver in Beckington, which is about nine miles south of Bath on the main coach road. It's still a school. It's still a boarding school, uh, but it's primary now. So it's now uh, called, I can't really see the name, but it's, it is still a functioning school. It's a, it was a classical academy, and I'll have to look at the list of topics that he would have discovered. He was taught Greek, Latin, mathematics, including mensuration, uh, it's a form of mathematics and I, I looked up a book on it but I couldn't understand a word of it so. but apparently it was really useful um, also the principles of taste moral philosophy astronomy ancient and modern geography and history so then but a few there's a few things after that you could take as well now I've got uh, I've got no doubt that he would have been bullied there you know he was illegitimate he was a slave owner's son People, people uh, think that it was Parliament that pushed the abolition of slavery, but it wasn't, it was the people. It started off in Manchester, Northern England, with a petition of 10,000 people demanding the um, ab abolition of sla uh, slavery, and it spread throughout the world. They were even, you could even buy coffee, not sorry, coffee, sugar. You can buy containers of sugar which said on them, not made from slave labour. I mean, that sounds a really modern thing, doesn't it? But, but it was packed then. So he would, have, he would have been bullied there, no doubt. And, but he survived it. In, in 1824, both his father and uh, Dr. Weaver died. And it was time for him to go and do his apprenticeship. So uh, to do your apprenticeship, you've got to do your apprenticeship before you go to med school. Not, not go to med school to your apprentice. So he went to do his apprenticeship with uh, Dr. Savory in Wendover. Um, oh, sorry. And uh, this is the. These are the tasks uh, that an ap apprentice would carry out. Most of the time, they'd be in the in the dispensary. Um, even in the night time they'd be in this dispensary because that's where they slept because they, they don't want anyone st stealing the drugs or the laudanum or whatever it is there but he would you know, he'd, he'd observe and assist at a, a wide variety of things and um, this is this is from a general thing about a guy who was an apprentice and told his story but Dr. Savory did things like um, attend wagon accidents um, and there's, a, rec there's um, a record of that in the paper so uh, this comment here at the bottom here is a comment by John Keats the poet who also did surgery uh, at Guy's Hospital was trained as a surgeon and he really resented Playing, paying 200 guineas a year to stand and hold the doctor's horse. <laughs> <laughs> so, off to it goes off to London, it's, which is uh, London's an exciting and, uh, and frightening place 
uh, for Dr. Crocom. This is the demolition of the old Lin London Bridge. So the, well, obviously the old bridge is on the right, and the new London Bridge has been uh, built already, and the crowds used to gather on the parapet to watch what's going on. The reason they, um, they demolished the old Indian bridge, even though it had been uh, in place since the 1200s and had houses and shops on the top of it, the reason it was, you know, the <coughs> River Thames was really the lifeblood of the city. There were barges and ferries moving up and down all the time. But the trouble is the way that the arches on the old Indo London Bridge had been designed meant that when the tidal surge came in, it was like a weir and you, you know, it was really hard to, to ride through it. So the, the barges and the ferrymen um, couldn't use the river the whole time for what they needed and so this big change was made. The, the river itself was thought to be a great source of disease um, because people threw the rubbish in there, they put the sewerage in there, dead dogs in there, even if some of the poorer people couldn't afford to uh, bury their relative who died so they'd at night sneak out and put them in the river. Some of this was taken advantage of by mudlarks, which were young children or uh, women, who waded around the shallows of the river, feeling for things in their feet. And if they found one lump of coal that had fallen off a coal barge, they'd have enough for that day to eat. It's, it, was, it was strange times. And although the, the water stunk, the people on the riverbank um, used it for drinking water they'd lower a, a bucket into it and leave it stand for a couple of days until the sediment settled and then they'd drink it. But that wasn't thought to be the cause of any disease. What was thought to be the cause of the disease <coughs> was the smell carrying miasma. Miasmas came up into the, into the air and somehow got into your body and uh, made you sick. So those those miasmas, uh, this is a map of the area, uh, this is the New London Bridge, this here is St Thomas Hospital and this here is Guy's Hospital. So St Thomas Hospital provided the surgical training and Guy's Hospital provided the medical training and they worked together until later, later times when there was a dispute and they separated. The uh, how's my voice going? Good. All right. So this 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 is a church here because it's figured with a cross, and that played a really important um, place in the training of medical students because if you went up the tower of the church, so when you were up the tower of the church, you'd come across this. Mm -hmm. which was built in the attic of the church. There was no, lo no room left in St. Thomas's, so they built an operating theatre. Uh, on the right here, this is, has a passage which goes across to St. Thomas's to the women's ward. Now this came a long time after the uh, men's operating theatre, and they used to do the operations on the women on the ward. But for some reason it distressed the other patients, <laughs> especially when there was no anaesthetic and no anti antisepsis. So, it was in a place now. So across the road where the medical training was done was Guy's Charity Hospital. Um, it was a charity hospital, um, but they only took people who would recover enough to get back to work. If, if you were never going to go back to work, or if you were, um, if you were dying, they wouldn't take you in. You had to be able to go back to work. And it was administrators who made the decision about who was admitted, not doctors or surgeons, 
and I just thought that sounded a bit familiar, familiar <laughs> today. <laughs> so it's quite busy. It was quite busy, and uh, while he was doing his training at Guy's and St Thomas's, he was also walking the wards at the London Hospital, and uh, he had the distinction of having his name mentioned three times in the Lancet, even before he qualified. Um, he won the Best Apprentice Award uh, even though he was not the apprentice of the man who picked who was the Best Apprentice which was a great um, change from the convention you know, people who were picking apprentices always picked their own apprentice <laughs> and the, per the, per the person who, 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 who missed out uh, wrote a letter of complaint to the Lancet um, <laughs> so I thought that was quite funny. And then uh, also the, the uh, Thomas Wakeley was the editor of the, of the Lancet. And he was a very opinionated, aggressive, uh, but, but influential, un influential man. And so he liked to criticise people quite a lot in the Lancet. And they criticised um, Joseph's class they, they criticised one of his tutors and they all objected to it they told the, it's, the article said the tutor was too old so uh, they objected because they really liked him as a tutor and, and then later on he wrote himself defending a surgeon who was criticised in the Lancet again um, not for being too old but because of his, the care of his patient well, uh, this made uh, Thomas Wakeley react to it, and he's castigated. Uh, under his article, he castigated Thomas uh, James. And it, I think it might have, might have um, counted against him later when he qualified. But before he qualified, he managed to uh, manage marriage, marry Isabella Lowe, a nurse. Uh, she signed this um, marriage certificate with her mark as most people seem to do in those days um, Isabella was born in Maudlin Rents Maudlin Rents, it's a great name it took me ages to find it on the map and the reason I couldn't find it it was now being demolished and is at the bottom of St Catherine's Docks which is right next to the Tower of London and uh, St Catherine's Docks were were, uh, it's alright, come in. St. Cath Catherine's docks are, had been commissioned to serve the whaling trade. And uh, so, Is Isabella worked at, as a, a nurse all of her life. And, uh, and I last found her towards the end of her life in a posh house in. in um, Westminster, so uh, she did quite well. And I think I picture her as a sort of an outgoing, streetwise cotton glass with a, a ready smile and a shrewd mind. Um, so his attentions with uh, Isabella uh, didn't stop him being from qualifying with his MRCS in 1833. Uh, he'd been trained by the brightest doctors of that time. Many of them leaving behind eponymous diseases. Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, which way am I going? How do I go backwards? Backspace. Backspace. I'm good at backspace. Use the arrow. Back arrow. Back arrow on this on one. Oh, right. you're right. Yeah. So he'd been uh, he'd been trained by you know, Britain's bright, brightest surgeons. <laughs> that was a slip of tongue because they left behind eponymous names such as Bright's disease, Addison's disease, Cooper's ligaments. And, uh, and Sir Astley Cooper, who was on there, he'd got his title by removing a sebaceous cyst uh, infected from the scalp of King George IV. It's quite a good way to get us a, a cold sir. So, uh, 
from that last miasma of these causes of diseases we talked about, contagions they know about since the plague because they know diseases can spread. Self-abuse was a very popular uh, reason for illness. Um, surgery anatomy, the teachers at surgery anatomy were very skilled and, and had a good knowledge um, but they didn't have anaesthetics or antisepsis to help them at all and uh, so their knowledge in, of anatomy and, and surgery um, didn't stop people from dying of uh, sepsis. These are, these are the only <laughs> treatments really that they had that were available. Quinine for malaria, uh, digoxin for, they used it in advanced heart failure, laudanum for pain relief, mercury for syphilis, herbal products which they tried to look at scientifically, although it had been around for a long time. Senna and bleeding. Now senna will make you open your bowels and bleeding is supposed to let the um, miasmas come out of your body. And they did a lot of copying, but the, probably the most useful thing they did is have their presence. So you know when you see on these old movies that the doctor sits down in the corner of the room while someone's dying, they don't do anything but they take the pressure off the off the uh, relatives. So what I, want, what I wanted to know is why why Joseph wanted, left England when he was at the peak of his job. Um, and I think these might be some of the reasons. Uh, there were very few jobs available because medical schools had opened, opened up in Scotland but also provincial medical schools were opening up around the country so there was a glut of doctors. In addition to that, the Napoleonic Wars had finished and the, when the Napoleonic Wars finished, the surgeons who were working in the army but weren't qualified um, were allowed to practice as if they were qualified in civilian life so they could go straight out into civilian life. Uh, the other thing is there was um, his, his uh, financial support had dried up because in uh, 1831 there'd been a, cur um, a hurricane hit the plantation which was called Harmony House. Well, what a funny name for a slave plantation, Harmony House. It hit it. So what happened? The plantation owners who would um, already had big mortgages had to take up bigger mortgages to pay for the damage. And so the um, so in 1833, the same year that Joseph qualified, the slave, slavery itself <coughs> was abolished. Slavery was abolished and so they couldn't keep using slaves. But luckily the British government came to their help um, and compensated the, s the slave owners for their losses. Um, unfortunately, the mortgage company decided that the compensation should be theirs and they won the award so that was so all of a sudden uh, Joseph's source of income dried up so it was hard to get a job he had no money he couldn't sort of afford his brass plate and so he looked for another job so at St Catherine's Dock which we talked about earlier um, the whaling agents, the, the agents for the whaling boats were advertising for doctors because every whaling ship from Britain had to have a doctor as a surgeon, uh, they had to have a surgeon on board and so he had a choice, he had a choice, he could go up to the Arctic or he could go to the Pacific. The Arctic advantage was that there were shorter trips and they didn't have to worry about the blubber going off before they got back home the Pacific whaling, they would be away for three to four years, but it sounded a bit more exciting, I think. So I want to show you this picture of a whaling ship. I've been wondering how it would come out up there. I wanted to show you this diagram, although it is rather busy. Um, the whaling ship on, in the Pacific was actually a factory ship. The uh, 
You can see the, the four boats that they use from the side, the boats that they use for the whaling, uh, and then there's the spare boat on the top there. But in the middle here, you will notice that this is where they kept the tripods. You know the big tripods that you always see when you go to an old museum? Where they put the blubber in from the whale, melted it down into whale oil, put it into barrels which were made by a cooper out of staves of wood and iron hoops. And so it was quite, quite a busy sort of uh, situation. Now we talked about Joseph being upstairs, downstairs, when he was in 6 Alfred Street. And he was also a bit ups, up, upstairs, downstairs here. Because although his quarters were in the after the ship, um, where the captain's cabin is, um, he was the only officer on board who was allowed to go into the forecastle where the crew slept. He, he was allowed to do that. Otherwise, the other officers uh, couldn't go in unless they were... Um, unless they were invited by the crew. So why did they need a doctor? Well, this is why they needed a doctor. Um, this, this is a sperm whale. You can tell it's a sperm whale because the spout goes forward rather than up. And um, this is a, a really common occurrence. You know, they'd harpoon the whale when it came up to breathe and then get towed behind it like a... And, uh, and then when it came up for its next breath, they'd get in there and kill it. But all the, one of the things that the whale did before it died is it rolled. And that happened, you know, it happened, it twisted the ropes around and sometimes tangled around people's legs and dropped them down and drowned them. Uh, sailors generally in those days couldn't swim. They never learned to swim because a bark, a big sailing bark like this, doesn't turn around easy. If you fall overboard, um, it's going to be ages. Uh, no. So they'd rather just uh, drown than hang around in the ocean to be eaten by a shark. That was their suspicion. The uh, so. Uh, when they get, got back to the boat, uh, it was still still dangerous too. You can see the way they put a hook um, through the whale's skin and blubber, and pull it up, pull the pull the strip up, and the whale rolls over. And these guys on the side, which look like flippers, are actually um, cutting into tools, which cut into the onto the, the track that they want the blubber to come off with. And there's the sharks waiting in case you fall off your perch there. <coughs> so these yellow spots are um, the only place we know for sure that uh, Lucinda uh, went to. Uh, started off in Gravesend, popped into the Mediterranean, came back to Perambuco in Brazil, round the hall, and up to Iquique, Iquique, which is always changing hand, but I think it was held by Peru in those days. Now, uh, Iquique is a good place to stop and reprovision. It's, um, but it's a, it was a very busy port because it had the only major nitrate source in the world, in the desert behind it. And the nit nitrates, of course, were used throughout the world for explosives and for uh, fertilizer. So they stopped in there for, for provisions, and the superintendent of the mine asked um, Dr. Crocom to visit his wife, and uh, he performed a surgical operation on her, because the ships, when they were provisioning, usually stayed in port for about 12 days or so. And uh, the family law uh, is, says that he received as payment uh, a belt with eight golden doubloons hidden in it. Um, it's hard to know. So anyway, they went up to the Marquises, which is sort of on that little horny bit sticking out, uh, into the ocean. They did call in at Stewart Island, um, where they picked up a, an islander, a Kingsmill islander, uh, and they 
promised to take him back to the Gilbert Islands, uh, which is what we call the Kingsmill Islands now. Uh, but just over here, it came to a, came to a sticky end. Um, so I'll have to write this, read this, because it's a bit complicated. On the 20th of January 1830, with a third mate at the helm, Lucinda ran into an uncharted reef in the middle of the night during a squall. They were 75 miles northwest of the uh, end, the top end of New Caledonia. The vessel struck so violently it was impossible to save her. There were 29 men on board and they provisioned four boats with clothing, food and water, a sextant and a chronometer. Those left on board, including the captain, had to slide down the months I'm sorry, as they lowered the boats, the starboard bilges gave away and Lucinda turned on its side. Those left on board, including the captain, had to slide down the Munt's metal to get into the boats. Munt's metals was a, an early sort of form of brass, which they used in, um, instead of copper to coat the bottom of the boats to, to stop the worms getting into it and rotting it. Right, they... It was really rough, and, and uh, most of the food they put on board was bread, uh, but that got ruined straight away. They headed for La Hertz Island, which is just to the northwest of New Caledonia. Uh, the New Caledonians had a terrible reputation for cannibalism, so they thought they might get away with it on, the, on an island. They landed there and found a few coconuts and took on some water, and then a big group of natives uh, came along the beach. And so they rushed back to get into the boat and try to push themselves up. But the natives dive after them into the surf and try to grab them and grab the boats and grab them. And so the whalers took out the knife and, and slashed away at their hands and arms and eventually got away. And then they had to, they had to get out through the reef, which is around La Hertz Island, and, uh, and start on their long voyage. They did have sails. They could pull the a sail. They had a... The, um, I, was, I think the boats were quite long boats, about 20 foot long I think, I might be wrong yeah. uh, no. so uh, five days in uh, the, the Kingsmill Islander who they were carrying from Stewart Island took out his knife and plunged it into the neck of an apprentice boy who was sat in front of him, he then tried to attack killed him, killed him then he tried to attack the other apprentice boy, but he only got a flesh wound. And then there was another islander on board, and he tried, tried to attack him, and the guy fended him off with his hands uh, until the rest of the crew grabbed hold of this King's Middle Highlander, and they threw him overboard and left him to his fate and carried on the way. So, so the next day, one of the boats started leaking badly, and they had to abandon it. So they had to take the 20, how many men left now, 27 men, the 27 men in to three boats now. So the, the water was get, getting ready to go over the gunwale, so they had, to, they had to get rid of everything. They had to get rid of the sexton, the chronometer, because they didn't have a sexton, it's very hard to tell where you are, and um, the chronometer. The captain had two hundred pounds worth of um, ready cash that he had to throw overboard. <laughs> now I, I do not know if Dr. Crocom threw away his eight doubloons hidden in his belt. Uh, I don't. I think he would. I think he was. He was too good not to. Um, so two days later, two days later, don't forget to go in all the way. Oh. Sorry. So this is this is where they um, this is where they hit the reef. This is La Hurst Island, and then they made across the way. They were heading there to they were heading down actually to Morton Bay, which is down here, is where Brisbane is now. That was a thousand miles away, a thousand miles of ocean with nothing after La Hurst Island there. And th and the day after they'd lost that boat. There were another squall came up, and the boat was capsized and sunk, 
and the carpenter was, was drowned. So all of them had to get into two boats now. So it was looking a bit desperate and uh, they had to th throw away any food that they had and they just kept a few soggy dry biscuits and uh, they threw off all the clothing as well because they were just getting all down. And they made their way slowly <laughs> across to the Australian continent. And uh, when they got there, they found that they were actually in Hervey Bay uh, rather than, was it Harvey Bay? It might be Harvey Bay, rather than Morton Bay. Now there they managed to catch some fish. It, the, it, the weather had calmed down and they were able to dry out the first time they'd been able to get dry since, since they started on the 20th of January. And um, sorry, these, these white marks on here. They, they mark off the days, so it was a 13-day journey. And so they caught some fish, they got some water, and they had berries to eat as well. Unfortunately, the berries were poisonous, so they all got diarrhoea. Uh, so they, they ma managed to set off again, and, uh, but the wind had dropped, and they had to depend on rowing. Uh, when they got around the point there, they so when it, this was success, and it's it, in a way it was success, but it's actually the schooner success, who was becalmed, and so because it was becalmed, they were managed to catch it, and the crew took them aboard, took their boats aboard, and took them to Sydney. Um, so they were hauled aboard the schooner success, exhausted, ill nourished, and nearly naked. So this is Sydney in 1838, it's quite a metropolis and uh, it wasn't long before all the, all the crew had been given jobs um, as soon as they recuperated. Now uh, Joseph was offered to come to Otaku in, uh, near Wellers Rock on the Otago Peninsula because they had a shore whaling station there. If you, uh, Look at this picture here. I don't know if you can make any sense of it. Uh, but this is the Otago Harbour. This is Otaku here. This is Wakoaiti. Now, in comparison to Sydney, um, the Maori population had been um, decimated by all this um, incoming disease. And then there was a few whaling stations dotted around the coast. So, uh, so when you look at this picture of the Taku, which I think was 1844, I think, uh, it looks pretty idyllic, but the whaling station itself was, you know, had rotten meat and and blubber. Uh, it was a pretty stinky, awful place. And. Um, so when Joseph was there, the manager of the station and part owner of the station was Edward Weller. That's why you get the name Weller's Rock. And Octavius Harwood, who's got that very famous uh, journal, um, they had breakfast with Edward Weller in the morning. And, and one day, Edward took out a, cu a cudgeon, is it a cudgeon? Something to hit people over the head with, what's it called? Hmm? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, a big piece of wood. A big piece of wood. And hit uh, hit Joseph over the head. And uh, for good measure, when he was on the floor unconscious, he gave him another blow to the head. And he was bleeding profusely. Uh, Edward Weller immediately um, immediately was remorseful. And so doing the good thing, even though he was bleeding profusely from his head, he decided to bleed him, so he bled him. <laughs> and uh, and he got, then he got a, a bucket of water and threw it over him, which brought him round, and he took a while to, to recover, during which time Edward Weller and his, well, his wife Paparu, his <coughs> Maori wife Paparu, um, sort of, they went out shooting and got 
waterfowl and fed him and made sure he would. He did recover, uh, but, that's, but he decided to go back to Sydney. I didn't really like that sort of environment. And uh, when he got to Sydney, that's when he met Johnny Jones. Most people have heard of Johnny Jones, who was a set, settler down there. And he offered him a, a, ta- a, a job at Wako Aiti. So this is an 1842 map of Wako Aiti Bay. So the whaling shears were here, uh, but the whaling station was down here. Um, this is where Johnny Jones had his farm. And it says uh, white settlers are there, but uh, at the time that uh, Joseph went, uh, there weren't any settlers at all, just the whaling station. Um, up on the hill, uh, Pukataraki there, was a, a Maori village. Um, and I, I'm thinking that um, he... I, I was thinking that when he got there, he's made fr- he made friends with some Maori chief there. And I, I'm thinking it was Karako who, was, who lived in Pukataraki around that time. Um, so he worked there for a long time. Um, he he had to walk everywhere. He he still serviced a taku. Uh, if he would get a boat, he'd, he'd walk to Blue Skin Bay. He'd walk to Meraki. Um, didn't get paid because there was no cash to pay you with in those days. And six uh, twelve p.m. Through Caraco, he met Arapara. Um, this, this is a, a list of the children they had together. Uh, they, ha- they had a, a, a Maori marriage ori- originally, but when uh, James Watkin came out as a missionary, they got married in a Christian ceremony in 1844. Unfortunately, she developed tuberculosis and she died in 1850 from the tuberculosis. It's what um, Caraco would have called a graveyard cough and Joseph Crookham would have called consumption. Uh, two days after uh, Arapara had died, uh, Henry Crookham died of TB too. Uh, James Crookham, this is James Crookham here. And he's, he's quite easy to track. He, uh, he married a, a Maori woman and they went up to um, up to Timaru and he worked for the um, Harbour Wand and uh, they became quite celebrities. Um, James did acquitted himself really well in a rescue and they were always in the paper, um, Mr and Mrs James Crokham, um, for going to the ballet or, or, uh, or going to a ball and Mrs Crokham won the nail driving contest at the local fair. <laughs> There's a story I'll skip because I think I'm running a bit out of time. <coughs> I was going to tell you a story about um, James, James, Jones's, James Jones, an eight and a nine year old boy, and this chap called Dal, Dalziel, who told the story of him and uh, Jamie Jones and uh, Dr Crookham's son, James Crookham, when they were playing together up on the hill near Jones's farm, and they decided <coughs> to set fire to this area to clear it so they could um, so they could grow chickens on it. They were only eight or nine and really didn't have any idea the word, but the fire got out uh, underway, got out of out of control. And uh, the father came looking for them with a whip, but they all hid until it was dark, etc. And it told quite a nice story that these eight and nine year olds could um, could play together, uh, with um, Joseph being of mixed, um, sorry, James Croak and being of mixed race. Um, but if you look on this here, this is Eliza Crokham, who at the age of fifteen died suddenly. She was in Dunedin. She was. Uh, I want to draw your attention. Uh, this is the, this is her coroner's case, and this is the surgeon's remarks. And when you come down to this line, which has got a, 
a mark across it. It says she has been too well fed, and you know these half calves are always idle. So you get these mixed stories. It seems that that James perhaps didn't um, didn't feel any uh, prejudice against them, but obviously it was still there in the in the early settlers. Uh, she died of a, a brain abscess, and which the surgeon said had burst, and it seems it was from a a chronic otitis media which was undiagnosed and untreatable in those days but she had she had matriculated from school and uh, it was funny that this should just judge her that way just quickly one more slide I think Mary Ann Warden she was uh, born in Angus Forfar, Scotland she was the legitimate daughter of Margaret Lowe and Thomas Warden in the 1841 census, she was living with her grandmother, mother, three older uncles and a younger illegitimate child of her mother's from a different father. But ten years later, you find her in a Christian school in Edinburgh uh, as a housemaid. And I think this is uh, where she learned to read and write. She was obviously uh, very independent and, and very resolved because she left England uh, in a bark the bark was stately uh, when she was 17 years old uh, she was 18 by the time she arrived in 1852 it's a long voyage remember and in 1854 she married Dr Crocom she, she, was, she was an intelligent forthright Scottish lad as, as you were, uh, would expect for example you know, holding the fort when he was away walking treating cases and uh, when Joseph was appointed as postmaster she did most of the work she moved she moved to Dean Eden in the later years of his life and once she'd passed a hundred years old she was uh, regularly appeared in the newspaper everyone reported on her birthday um, she, she was still reading the paper and enjoying others company had friends coming round she didn't like that in the early 900s women were wearing shorter skirts. Now this is Mary uh, Mary Ann Warden under her name and on the left there we have her wedding dress which has a model in it is Audrey here. This, this young lady sitting over here is Audrey who is uh, Joseph Grick Joseph and Marianne Crocombe's great grandchild. <laughs> now the dress is is, uh, is in the possession of Helen, her daughter now, and it's in really good condition. I've been, had the real privilege to go and, and feel it, and, <laughs> and uh, it's amazing that that happened because I, I've got a friend who's. Uh, a costume expert and uh, she said that this was the colour that they had wedding dresses in those days, the design and everything fits and everything just fits and she would have worn it every Sunday to go to church after her wedding, it wasn't just one of those modern one day things so this this is my last slide. Um, oh, I've gone over time. That's, it's just a summary of, of where he came. I think his story is a real interesting one. And um, if you haven't learnt anything today, though, uh, from the talk, you will have learnt uh, why the accent of people from Hull. Is the been voted the most ugly accent in Britain? <laughs> <laughs> so, if if you want, if you, uh, I've sort of, I think I didn't want to go any further. Really, I'll get Dr. Crocombe to sign us off. And if you've got any questions uh, before people start to drift away, wonderful. Okay, questions. There must be questions. What happened to his first wife?
his, his first wife, if you, yeah, he, she was left behind. And what happened in those days, if you, uh, if you didn't see your husband for seven days, he went to see you, didn't, sit, didn't see them for seven years, you could declare yourself a widow. And exactly seven years after he left England, she married again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what was the colour of the wedding dress? Do we know? Uh, how would you describe it, Helen? It's black, was it? No, it's black. We had white fishing, is it called? And different white lace and things like that. The outside is a sort of, I thought it was a sort of brown, isn't it? Outside. Could you repeat that, please? We couldn't hear it over here. Sorry, what was that? What the lady said, continue. So, Audrey, what, what was that, Audrey? Ah, not here. That was basically black, but I wasn't a sort of a, a musky, like a dark. Yeah, it's, it's really hard to explain. Basically, but hand hand white. Um, what amazes me is the texture. It almost feels as if it would be waterproof. Mm. And it would have been hard wearing in those days. You know, there was no pavements to walk on. <laughs> it probably was black because all aged black garments do go that brownish right. sort of colour. Uh, yeah. 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 It's almost like an oil cloth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was like a very thick taffeta. Like a very thick yeah. taffeta. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I found her on the boat trip going down into Port Chalmers um, to buy the material for it because there'd been a shipment of material. So this was about two months before she got married and she would have gone home and stitched. Where do you live at, uh, Helen? Uh, Helen's Hill. Oh, Helen's Hill. Yeah. 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 Place where you could have people? Or? Not a hospital. He, he lived in about three different places. Um, mm -hmm. What I didn't tell you is that um, he lived with a rapper in a house that they'd got um, halfway up the hill that goes towards Johnny Jones's place. And uh, But when uh, a rapper died and the child died two days afterwards, the um, the local Maori declared, declared the place tapu mm -hmm. and burnt his house down, so he lost everything again. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and then he moved into a place <coughs> on Hawkesbury Bush. And then in the gold rush days, people didn't come through, people landed in Dunedin coming here for the gold rush, but they couldn't get inland until they had to go out to sea again and land on Wakawaiti Beach. And John Jones made a, a town that came out from the beach and so there were uh, houses on both sides but, but they, they were um, landed in uh, Wakarita Beach and up they went to uh, Beach Street and were buying their goods from there and staying in the hotels then off to go to where Palmerston now is and then cut in land and so he had a house there in Beach Street and uh, so I'm not sure, but I'm not sure where he died. He's buried in the St. John's Church in Beach Street. And when his wife died in Dunedin, she was brought out here and buried in Beach Street too. Oh, just a personal note, because I don't suppose you ever came across in the search in Jimmy Jones' farm. My great grandfather lived on that farm. His name was William Reynolds Hall. So what, was was what was his name? William Reynolds Hall. And he came out as a ship's boy on a, sh on a ship to Port Chalmers. I can't remember the name of the ship, but I do have a record of it. Mm. And he, he received permission from the captain to leave the ship. And he was only 14 at the time and went and worked on oh. Jimmy Jones's farm. I've heard that, that story. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. Ah, well, it'd be really interesting to chat with you about it oh, afterwards. Yeah. 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 So, so he was my great grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> what did he do after that? Did he, he stay came, working he, he on the farm? Up, no, he moved down to Dunedin and became a 
a prosperous, he owned a shop in Pitzer Street in Pitzer Bank, mm -hmm. became quite prosperous. He stood for council twice but didn't get elected. Um, he had, I think it was um, 13 children, 11 of whom survived to, to um, adulthood. One died in World War One. My grandfather was the youngest and was born in 1896. And unfortunately, he died before even my father was born in an accident. He was a, an electrical linesman and died in a thunderstorm um, and fell off the roof. We don't know whether he, you know, he was struck by lightning or, you know, it's well, very stormy and slippery. When, it, when you asked mm. if uh, Dr. Perkin might, uh, he, he tutored Dr. Perkin's kids for a bit. And when Arapa died, he moved into the single men's quarters at the farm. And uh, during that time, he was, you know, really got into the street. He was really, you know, really pushed down, depressed mm -hmm. about it. Did any of his records survive? You know, do we know what sort of clinical problems he dealt with uh, during his time on land? Yeah, the, there's there are a few, but not many. Um, this is <coughs> this is his signature here is from a letter to. Octavius Harwood, um, because he, although he'd, he'd left Otaku, he kept a relationship with him and he'd borrowed um, Octavius Harwood's medicine chest. And uh, so, and he was apologising because he'd kept it for five years. <laughs> so, this, this is why he says, you know, believe me, I remain yours truly. So, and there's, there's a there's uh, news, newspaper accounts of him going out to hospital, and there's newspaper accounts of coroner's um, inquest. At once, at one time, the coroner um, sort of grumbled at him. He, he said, uh, "This guy had Joseph had said he died of a head injury because he had a big head wound," and the coroner said to him, uh, "Did you crack his skull?" You know, so remove the top of his skull to see if he had a head injury. So he said, no, there was no need to it. You could see it was a head injury. So anyway, the coroner, I think, uh, it sounded like uh, to crack a skull. It sounds like a, a word that a, a doctor would use. And uh, I think Hocken was the coroner somewhere around that time. I'm not, but I'm not sure. This talk about him going out to a, a like a chap who had fallen off his horse and his leg had caught in the stirrup. And he was being dragged. He was dragged around and munched up his leg. But there's no clinical records. So there, there is that uh, medical kit of his that's purported to be his. In the, in the yeah, I think that, I think that's the one that he he used it. But I think it was Octavius. It was very sophisticated uh, for a time that had no anaesthesia and had some interesting uh, bone cutting tools in it. Oh, <laughs> dear. Well, the, sur the surgical kit that you sent in the picture of it's just wonderful. God, blimey. It's, uh, it, it, it can't be the one that he got given at uh, the London Hospital for his thing because everything would have been lost in the, in the rescue. Does this medical kit exist still? Sorry? Does the medical kit you talked well, about still yeah, exist? Uh, I think Travis uh, identified that he wouldn't have bought anything himself because of the shipwreck. But oh. there's a kid sitting in Toitu, which yeah, is well, he would have credited to him. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it is. Amputating saw, and a, a, the, the whole boring uh, saw that would be quite good if he had any plumbing work to do at home right now, <laughs> possibly for head, head things, but it's um, the, in days before end season. The, the most miserable operation, I think, which was done very often, I don't know if he did it, but it was done very often, is removal of bladder stones. Uh, to remove a bladder stone, you made a, an incision uh, half an inch in front of the anus, um, stuck something up there, got your finger in, and tried to hook the bladder stone out. Yeah. And people were being painful. Yes. No, no more questions. Trevor. Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Please join me.